Hi there, my name is Terry from Tree Marie Soap Works, and today I'm going to show you how I made this bar. This technique is called the Kiss Pour. It is the technique we are doing this month for the Soap Challenge Club that's hosted by Amy Warden. This month we have a guest teacher named Joanne Watkins, and she adapted this technique from a fluid acrylic pour painting technique. Basically what it is, is you are pouring from two pitchers, and your streams of fluid from those pitchers meet together and they kiss, and that creates a really neat technique. For this particular kiss pour design, I decided to meander my pores around and as long as they're touching, that constitutes the kiss technique. When making this particular batch, we got a big snowstorm and we had 13 inches of fresh fallen snow outside and I decided to use that freshly fallen pristine snow as my liquid in this batch. And I scented it with a fragrance called Enchanted Forest from Muddy Soap Company that really just seemed to go with that snow theme. Stay tuned to the end of the video where I go over a few things that I learned while making this soap and things I would have done differently. Thank you everyone for watching and now let's go get some snow. Before I go outside and get the snow, I need to zero the scale with the pitcher on it. Then I go outside and get my snow and I add or subtract snow and in this case I had to add a little bit and I got my measurement of my liquid which is the water amount. Next I measure the sodium hydroxide. Of course, sodium hydroxide is something that's a little dangerous and it's something that you need to treat with respect and know the proper safety procedures. I would recommend that if you're not familiar with soap making that you start with learning about lye safety. Here I add that sodium hydroxide to the snow very carefully and I just make sure everything is all dissolved. And then once it's dissolved, I set it in a well ventilated area that's free from any kids or pets and I let it cool. Then I measure the sodium lactate and I set that aside with my lye water so I don't forget to add it later. Sodium lactate is a natural ingredient. It's actually a liquid salt. When I first started making soap, I thought that salt was probably drying for your skin. Salt just seems like it shouldn't go on your skin, but salt is actually a humectant. It draws moisture from the air. Do you ever notice that your salt shaker gets clumpy? It's because it draws moisture. Well, when you use it in soap, it really doesn't add any moisture to your skin, but it doesn't subtract it either. It's on your skin for such a short time, but it does make your bar harder. It makes it last a little longer and it helps it to release from the mold. I use it at a rate of one teaspoon per pound of oils. So if I am using two pounds of oils, I use two teaspoons of sodium lactate. After that, I measure the coconut oil and I start to melt that in the microwave just using short bursts. I start usually around 45 seconds. It depends on your microwave temperature, but I will gradually lower that time as the coconut oil gets closer to being melted. And in the meantime, I start to measure my liquid oils. I start with the avocado oil, then the castor oil, and then the olive oil. I top off the ingredients with the little squeeze bottles filled up with the oils because I am measuring them into the same container. I don't wanna go over. After I'm done with the liquid oils, I measure the fragrance and today I'm using Enchanted Forest from Muddy Soap Company. It's a very well behaved fragrance. It does discolor slightly to a yellowish tone, but it really can be combated with the titanium dioxide. So I was really pleased with how this fragrance worked. It is a new one for me. It's another one that I will add to my behaves well list because I've made three batches with it and I've been very happy with it. Next, I measure the shea butter into the melted coconut oil and I stir that until it's melted and if I need to, I microwave that until it's just barely melted. Then I measure the cocoa butter and I add that to my melted coconut oil in shea butter. Again, I stir that until it's melted or I microwave it gently until it's just barely melted but it's completely clear with no streaks. Next I prepare the colors and I like to have them pre-diluted before I stir them into my batter because I don't want to have to stick blend them in. I'm using neons for the turquoise color and they tend to want to clump so it's easier to get all those clumps worked out before you get them in the batter. For the turquoise color, I'm using radioactive green at a rate of 0.25 teaspoons per pound of oils, and I'm using the Blue My Mind color at a rate of 0.75 teaspoons per pound of oils, and then I also use titanium dioxide at a rate of 1 teaspoon per pound of oils, and I'm using this for 20% of my batter. 
All of the colors I'm using today are from Elements Bath & Body. Next for the gray, I'm using Smoky Black Mica, and I'm using it at a rate of one and a half teaspoons per pound of oils, and I'm using that for 20% of my batter as well. For the white, I already measured that, but I'm going to take you through how I figured it. I'm using two teaspoons per pound of oils, so I'm using per pound of oils. I go to the Elements Bath & Body Colorant Calculator, and the very bottom calculator is per pound of oils, and it's when you're figuring your batter at a percentage. For this one, I'm using 60% of my batter. I already know that I have 35 ounces of oils, so I put in 35. Next line, I put in the percentage of batter, so I put in 60. And then the next line, I put in the two teaspoons per pound of oil. Oils. Then I hit calculate and that gives me the amount in dry powder and then it gives me the amount dispersed in oil in teaspoons and then the next line is dispersed in oil in tablespoons. Now that the hard oils are completely melted, I go ahead and add the liquid oils. And you can see when I put them in there that they're still not completely melted. There's little streaks in there and that comes from the palmitic acid and a little bit of stearic acid that's in the olive oil and the avocado oil. So you just need to stir that and make sure that all those streaks are gone. That means that it's all completely melted. Next, I add the fragrance to this oil butter mixture and I stir that until it's all mixed in. I have really been liking adding the fragrance to my oils. I wouldn't do this in every case, but when the fragrance oils are known to behave, I really like doing it this way because I don't have to divide the fragrance later. Really, I think that adding the fragrance now tempers it down. It gets it all diluted and spread out and it's not such a shock. So you might not have acceleration as much as you would if you add it just straight later on. So I'm really liking how that's working for me. The trials of soaping with snow. There's a little more dirt in the water when you melt it. You wouldn't think so, but you get that fresh, fresh snow and there's still little specks, little pieces of fuzz in there. So I tried to strain it through a fine mesh strainer and a piece of muslin, but that piece of muslin didn't work very well. It was so tightly woven that nothing much could get through there. I had to kind of pick out the pieces and specks by using a spoon. So I think there were probably little fuzzies that did get through into the soap. So we'll just have to see how that comes out. I don't know if I would recommend soaping with snow, but it was just a fun thing when we had this big snowstorm and so I just wanted to try it. Off camera, I added the sodium lactate to the lye water before I added it to the melted oils. And here I'm adding that lye solution to the melted oils and butters. I don't talk about it often, but you probably notice that I tilt my bowl a little bit when I'm adding the oils and I pour down the side. That's all to prevent adding extra air bubbles to my batter. They're hard to get out once you get them in there. Next, I stick lend until an emulsion is reached, and by emulsion, I just mean everything is mixed and it's not separated. You can see a ring of oils around the edge of the bowl. That means that it's separated. The oils will always float on the top and the lye water kind of goes directly to the bottom. So we need to get that to mix together and stay mixed. Once my batter is at an emulsion, I split my batter. Off camera, I already figured out 20% of my batter and 60% of my batter. So I have two 20% and one 60%. And really, you only need to figure out 20% of your batter because the 60% will be what's remaining after you've measured out the two 20%. Next, I just hand stir in the colorant since it's already prepared and I use the white for the main portion of the batter and the gray and the turquoise are for the other two containers.
Once I have all the colors incorporated, I'm just waiting on that batter to get to the proper trace. I'm looking for it to have some resistance when I'm stirring it, but I don't want it to be watery at all. I want it to be almost medium trace. If it's still somewhat watery and it's taking some time, I will use my little cordless mini mixer. That has a lot less force than the stick blender, so it will not accelerate the batter so much, and it will just help to get to the proper trace a little more quickly. Once I have my batter to the proper trace, I just pour a little white in. And then on top of that, I stripe in a little of the turquoise and the gray. I pour the turquoise and the gray in the pitcher so that it doesn't break through the surface. If you let it go below the surface of the white, a lot of times it will get muddled when you pour. And I'm pouring this just so that these two streams of soap batter touch each other when they're pouring. This is my first time doing the kiss pour, so I didn't really know what to expect, but I really loved the first pour, but I quickly realized that thin layers work the best to see these uh, striations in your pour. As you get more batter in there, it scrunches it up. It makes it all squished and the design kind of goes away. So what I decided to do is just do a meandering pour instead of that circular pour in one spot because I I knew it was going to get all scrunched up and I didn't really want to pour a bunch of layers and let them set up in between. So I did the meandering pour and I really loved the results. This was a really fun technique and I loved how it came out. I think you could probably really create the same effect by using just one pitcher. It is a lot like the Cosmic Wave that we did for the soap challenge one time. It was brought to us by Tatiana Serco and I really love that one. I have two other videos on the Cosmic Wave and I also mentioned a few tips in my marble soap video that would pertain to the Cosmic Wave. If I remember right, I said that pouring close to the surface really helps and also I poured quickly. When I was just dumping those layers in for that marble soap, I had nine layers and I just wanted to cut it vertically so I wasn't really worried about how it spread out. I just dumped it in basically and it created such neat striations that I remember that I was thinking that pouring in quickly would work well for the cosmic wave. For this technique, I like striping the batter in on the top of your white batter or your base color and then just pouring until you think your batter is starting to get muddled a little and then you refresh that and start to pour again. Continue pouring like this until you're out of batter and try to budget your batter so that you have all the colors left over at the end and all the proper proportions. It's harder than you think to have that every time it seems like I don't quite have the mixture and the colors that I want at the end. I wished I would have had a little more white at the end, but actually my last pours were some of my favorite pours. They had depth to them, they had movement. Even though there wasn't a lot of white and they were slightly muddled, I just loved how they came out. Really, I think if you do this technique, you're gonna like whatever you end up with. You can really pour it however you want and I think you will love the outcome. And I think they're fun to use too because they have those different designs throughout the whole bar. You know, you pour all those and you see them and and then you cover them up and what a treat when you use that bar. When I'm finished with this design, I oven process it and before I put it in the oven, I cover it. What I've found that works best is I have a piece of foam board that I have cut to the outer dimensions of that box and then I have another piece that's glued to the top of that that's cut to the inner dimensions of that box and by doing that it creates a little insert and it cuts down on that head space and that cuts down on soda ash. Next I preheat the oven and I only preheat it to the lowest temperature and I only preheat it for 30 seconds to a minute. I just want to get that air warm in the oven. 
I put the soap in the oven, put the lid on, and then I cover it with plastic wrap as well. I'm trying to eliminate any air getting inside there. Once that's done, I turn the oven off and I turn the oven light on. By doing that, it helps to maintain that heat that's surrounding the soap mold. And then before I go to bed, I turn the oven light off. In the morning, I take the soap out of the oven. If it still feels warm, I let it come to room temperature naturally before I cut it. And if it's humid, I'll wait another day to cut it to avoid soda ash. Okay, it's the next day and I cut my slab into nine bars and then I plane those bars. I plane the top and the bottom. I plane the top because it reveals a little more of the pattern and I plane the bottom just because I need it to fit in my boxes. For slab mold designs, I usually make a little extra batter because I usually need a little to stay in the picture for that particular design. So I make a little extra and I will pour that off into an extra mold or if I use it in the mold, I need to plane it off. And I plane it off and make it into a big soap ball and we use that as hand soaps at our sinks. Now that all I have to do is cut the soap and bevel it, I will let you know a few of the things that I learned during this batch and a few things I would have done differently. The first thing that I learned is the snow. I'm not sure I would make it out of snow again, but if I do, I would melt that snow first and then I would strain it out to get all the impurities out and then I would make the soap. But that kind of takes the fun out of it because it's really neat to see the lye melting that snow. So take it or leave it. I'm not sure either way if I would do that again. It was just kind of a novelty thing. But when I cut this soap, I didn't see any of the impurities. The ones that I couldn't get out were kind of just really really thin tiny pieces of wiggly fuzz. I don't know where that comes from outside. We live in a place that there's not much pollution or anything like that so I don't know what that is. Anyway we'll see what happens to the soap if it develops any dreaded orange spots or anything like that but I kind of don't think it will. I think it's fine. The next thing I learned is to pour as close as possible to the surface of the mold. The less of a stream down you have, the less of a chance it has to get muddled. Also, when you finish your pour and you're getting ready to go back and refresh the top, before you move your pitchers, let them just drip a little bit and finish their drips before you move them because they can really mess with your design when you have little drips across the surface of your soap. Another thing about this design is using the two pitchers, I'm not sure if it's necessary. I think the same effect could be achieved by just using one pitcher. It's kind of hard to see what's going on under there. I think next time I would just try it with one pitcher. That said though, with this technique, you can create so many different designs. I had three different tries at this. All of the designs looked completely different. So I think the sky's the limit with this particular technique. So I would encourage you to try it. If you've never tried Amy Warden's Soap Challenge Club, I would encourage you to try it. I started it in August of 2016 and every time I participate in the challenge, I learn something new and it just makes your learning curve speed up a little faster than you normally would because it forces you to kind of get out of your comfort zone. So check out the description below. I have a link for Amy Warden's Soap Challenge Club. Thank you so much for sticking it out to the end of the video and thanks for your comments. Thanks for hitting the like button. I appreciate all of you who have subscribed and hit the bell for notifications. That helps me out. I appreciate those of you who buy my soap and who buy a recipe every once in a while just to show me support. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I will leave you with some photos of the other two batches that I tried using this technique and I will see you back here next time. Have a great day.